welcome to our review on the history of genetics. So as we know from looking at science in all its different disciplines, then ideas in science do change over time. So we've not always had the same understanding that we've got today. And what we need to do is have a look and see how we've actually got to the point we are today with genetics by looking at those key scientists in the past. Now, the first one, the guy that's known as the father of genetics is Gregor Mendel. Now, we've got to go back to 1866 to look at his work. And what he actually did was he was actually a monk and he spent his time in his monastery working in the gardens with the peas. Now, when he was working with those peas, he actually observed that characteristics were passed from the parents to the offspring. And he made three key observations. The first one is that characteristics in plants were determined by what he referred to as hereditary units, that those units were being then passed on from each parent, so one from each going into the offspring, and finally, that the hereditary units could be either dominant or recessive. And he worked that out by doing a whole load of experiments with peas and looking at seeing the green features, the yellow features, whether they were wrinkled or non wrinkled. So he spent a lot of time playing with peas, but he did find those three key bits of information. So characteristics are determined by hereditary units. Those units are passed on one from each parent and they can either be dominant or recessive. The second key scientist we need to know about is in 1869, where we meet Frederick Miescher. Now, he actually discovered that there's this acidic substance present in the nucleus, which we called nucleon. We then take a bit of a jump in time to 1944, where Oswald Avery actually transferred genes. So he used bacteria and found that he could transfer DNA between different bacterial cells. And what he noticed was he could actually transfer that ability to cause disease from one strain of bacteria to another. And then when those bacteria reproduced, their offspring also had that ability. So he showed that genes are made of DNA. Moving six years further forward to 1950, we find Erwin Shargoff. Now, his key discovery was the base pairing. So what he actually noticed was even though different organisms have different amounts of DNA, then no matter what organism he looked at, then the DNA had equal quantities, quantities of adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine. So he then came up with the idea that adenine and thymine must go together and cytosine and guanine must go together. So this idea they have linked into a question in the past where they told you that it was 24% adenine and asked you to work out the percentages of the other bases. So obviously thymine would also be 24% and then just divide your remainder by two to give you a cytosine and guanine. Next, we come on to key people in the actual history of our genetics that sadly one is all too often forgotten. So in 1952, we have Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkins and what Rosalind Franklin actually did was she took this photograph of DNA using this process called X-ray crystallography. Now, what she actually did there was she got that image that you can see in the bottom left. And that was the first time we'd really seen DNA. Now, that then was taken by Morris Wilkins and he then passed it on to a couple of other scientists. The scientists that actually received that photograph were James Watson and Francis Crick, and they used that then to identify the double helix structure of DNA that we know today. So where we've got those two spirals, they're held together by the complementary base pairs. That's what we mean by double helix. And the only reason that they could actually come up with that was because of Rosalind Franklin's picture. Now, history obviously recognized Crick, Watson and Wilkins, but sadly, Rosalind Franklin had died of cancer, almost certainly as a result of her actual work using x-rays. So even though the other three scientists here were actually recognized and got the Nobel Prize, sadly, Rosalind Franklin received no actual acknowledgement for her work until much later on. Since Watson and Crick actually gave us that double helix structure of DNA in 1953, then in those years that came after that until the year 2000, we actually had different individual genes being discovered that coded for certain inherited disorders, things like cystic fibrosis. 
and we also saw the development of the field of genetic engineering. The next key event we saw was in 2003 when we actually completed the Human Genome Project, which was this incredibly long 20 year project, which had the whole goal of sequencing all of the genes in the human body, which turned out to be 24,000 genes. Since 2003, what we've actually tried to do is something called gene therapy, which is where we're actually looking to see if there's a way that we can replace faulty genes with normal copies to hopefully counteract some of these actual diseases. So because they could ask you about any of these scientists to do with the history of genetics, it's always good to come up with some kind of way to help you remember them. So mnemonics are fantastic for this. And this is just a little example I threw together there. Mixed martial arts can foster worldwide carnage. So just something that you can remember that gives you those first letters of each scientist. And that's hopefully going to help you remember not only the names of them, but also the order in which their discoveries came. Now, you don't have to use that one at all. Find something that works for you, but come up with something. And if you are a visual learner and rather have pictures, then come up with something that has those visual images next to it. But make sure you know each of those scientists and what they did.